Hello, my name is Cidem Çilem. I'm a professor of political science here at Union College in Schenectady, New York. Uh, my work as a political theorist focuses on the politics of protest. Uh, I explore uh, the significance and unintended consequences of how we as political scientists, sociologists, or as public intellectuals tell the stories of popular uprisings by using certain narrative frameworks and, and certain tropes. Uh, my 2021 book, In the Street, Democratic Action, um, theatricality and political friendship address this issue by exposing the theoretical underpinnings of the limiting and limited nature of success and failure and spontaneity and organization frameworks. It was these fr frameworks uh, that played a major role in the discussions uh, and that, that were surrounding the events that took place uh, in the early 2000s when a global wave of protest took, shook the world. For many, the topic of our conversation today, namely the 2013 Gezi protests, uh, those events were a part of this global movement towards uh, popular democratic uprisings and, uh, and, a, and a more democratic society. Uh, but before saying uh, more about Gezi, uh, I would like to take a minute uh, to thank Pınar Dinç and the Turkey Beyond Borders project for giving me this opportunity to share my work with you. As I will try to argue in the remaining 30 minutes or so, I believe that today it is more important than ever to remember the Gezi protests, not only to present an accurate image of the past, which is no doubt significant on its own terms, especially today, but also, and perhaps more importantly, to open up the possibility that the past can become an immense better force in the present. I would like to begin the seminar uh, with a brief discussion on the ongoing efforts on, uh, on the part of the current regime uh, in Turkey to rewrite the history of Gezi protests by propagating a narrative that aims to transform the event from a spontaneous popular uprising into a conspiracy hatched by foreign powers. In the second part of the seminar, I will turn to the scholarly accounts of, uh, on Gezi to show that even those scholars who highlight the importance of Gezi as a democratic event um, end up contributing to the erasure of the memory of the events due to the narrative frameworks that they employ. And the third and final part of the seminar, which will be the longest section, uh, will aim to bring to light what is erased in such accounts, namely the political practices of, the, of ordinary people in Gezi who staged alternative ways of living and in doing so demonstrated that another way of doing things is possible. Perhaps there is no better place to start discussing the regime's concerted effort to rewrite history than uh, the April 25, 2022 decision of the 30th Criminal Court. That day, the court announced that through a majority decision, they found Osman Kavala, a former business person and a prominent civil society figure, guilty of attempting to overthrow the government and sentenced him to life without parole. His co-defendants, architect Mücella Yapıcı, city planner Tayfun Karhaman, lawyer Can Atalay, documentary filmmaker Mine Özerden, film producer Çiğdem Matern, higher education director Hakan Altınay, and university founder Yiğit Ekmekçi, were all sentenced to 18 years in prison for allegedly aiding him. While it's tempting to call this trial process that took all these prominent civil society figures to prison, Kafkaesque, the phrase is, I believe, misleading as it fails to account for the openly political campaign that resulted in what can only be called a travesty of justice. That travesty of justice, which is so powerfully visualized in this work of cartoonist Cemdin Lemmish, involves, among others, uh, the overturning of an earlier acquittal. Uh, in 2020, all the defendants uh, were found innocent due to lack of evidence. Uh, it also involves a reassigning of the case to a different court for retrial. And, and there are so many uh, legally suspect maneuvers that made this possible. And finally, a retrial in which the judges reach their decision without evaluating any evidence. That this travesty of justice is the direct result of a political vendetta has been affirmed a couple of days ago. On September, 2000, uh, September 28, 2023, 
The appeals court announced its decision to uphold Osman Kavala's life sentence and 18 years uh, jail sentences of Çiğdem Mater, uh, Can Atalay, Mine Özerden and Tayfun Kahraman. Mücella Yapıcı and Hakan Altınay, whose convictions were overturned, had been re released from prison after over 500 days. And, and Amnesty International rightly called the decision which fails to implement the European Court of Human Rights earlier judgment to release Osman Kavala, Kavala, a pulling and a devastating politically motivated blow to human rights in Turkey. The trial and its horrifying outcome um, raised an important question. Why would the powers that be spend so much effort and time to ensure the conviction and imprisonment of a handful of people for the charging of and for the charge of organizing Gizi 10 long years after the events. I suggest that both the trial and the sheer cruelty and unlawfulness of the recently upheld convictions are part and parcel of the current regime ongoing efforts to erase the memory of Gizi, whose subversive potential that they seek to contain, while also ensuring that they can silence any meaningful opposition to the ongoing authoritarian turn in the country. And indeed, over the last 10 years, Erdogan used every opportunity to discredit Gezi, which remains the most significant popular challenge to his rule to this day. During the course of the events, he first sought to dismiss the importance of what was going on by suggesting that the protesters were nothing but a few vandals, he called them Chapulju, burning cars and destroying public property. Later, to present the protesters as a bunch of middle-class hapless activists with no understanding of the real problems and needs of ordinary people, while also dehumanizing those who, who frequented the park, he said the following, and I believe this requires uh, to be quoted at length. Uh, the translation uh, belongs to mine. This is Erdogan's own words from June 13, 2013. He said, I'm sorry, some people may have a need to look at the park from the top of the top stories of the hotel nearby. I don't have that kind of a need. I know Gezi Park perfectly well. Gezi Park is an extremely dirty place. It smells like piss. Many of them defecate there. In the aftermath of Gezi, perhaps in an unwitting recognition of the enormity of what had taken place, uh, Erdogan dialed up the tone of his rhetoric and began to characterize the protest as a coup attempt orchestrated and financed by foreign powers to unsettle Turkey. The most significant move in this effort to criminalize the protests was the government's decision to literally put Gezi on trial in 2017. It was the process that began with that trial that took Osman Kavala, Çiğdem Mater, Mine Özerden, Can Atalay, Mücella Yapıcı, and Hakan Altınay to prison as the organizers of the events. The changing official narrative of Gezi from an insignificant riot to a carefully organized conspiracy aims to obscure the fact that the regime never fails to forget, namely that as a spontaneous democratic popular uprising, Gezi did something no one thought that was possible. It shook Erdogan's sense of invulnerability in Turkish politics. Scholarly accounts demonstrate with great clarity the absurdity of the claim that somehow seven individuals could finance and direct massive protests that took more than 3.5 million people to the streets all around the country. And yet, in an ironic twist, many of these scholarly accounts themselves end up erasing the memory of the events due to the narrative frameworks that they employ as well. Next, I want to turn to that issue. One such framework uh, is that of success failure. Thus, for instance, um, uh, sociologist Jehan Tual, who sought to explain why Gezi failed to produce revolutionary change, pointed to, pointed to the large number of young professionals who attended the protest and argued that the occupation of the park was largely, a, and I quote, a new petty bourgeois affair. According to Toile's account, which surprisingly repeats some of 
Erdogan's earlier characterizations of the protesters as hapless middle-class activists, ignorant of the harsh realities of life, new petty bourgeois uprisings like Gezi are bound to remain, and I quote, elusive, end of quote, due to, and I quote again, the cultural dispositions of this class and its aversion to organization and discipline. While other scholars offer different explanations as to why Gezi failed, they too share Tuval's view that Gezi protests lacked organization. These scholars also rep repeat numerous tropes that obscure from the view the work of ordinary people who started a protest movement, which lasted more than two weeks without the guidance of formal political organizations. In the third and the final section of the seminar, I would like to discuss a couple of these tropes to bring to light what they erase. One of the most frequently used imagery in discussing Gezi is that of an eruption, when something suddenly, to use the words of one author, ticked on the morning of May 31st. And while it is certainly true that the Gezi protests caught many by surprise, as if coming out of nowhere, Contrary to the popular trope, contrary to what the popular, suggest, the popular trope suggests, it did not come out of thin air. It was prior political struggles which altered the conditions of possibility for new forms of resistance and generated a new set of political habits that made it possible for thousands of people in Gezi to act spontaneously. That is to say, and I think this is very important because spontaneous means not immediate, but it means acting of one's own accord. So it was these practices and uh, the existing new forms of resistance that enabled thousands of protesters of Gezi to act spontaneously, that is to say of their own accord in a swift and seamless manner in response to the violent eviction of a handful of activists from the park in the early morning hours of May 31st. For indeed, just to give a couple of examples, uh, in the years preceding Gezi, environmentalist activists had already come up with a range of different resistance practices, many of which were appropriated by the protesters in Gezi. Uh, those practices include establishing tent encampments, creating human chains to stop construction machines, and reopening formerly privatized areas to common use which were frequently used to prevent the government forces from undertaking environmentally pernicious projects, including the construction of power plants, hydroelectric power stations, and the creation of mines. In a similar way, a government initiated neoliberal urban renewal projects, which displayed thousands of people in Istanbul, had already given rise to numerous grassroots movements and organizations that were frequently staging public protests before Gezi. Finally, partially in response to Erdogan's regime's escalating attacks to control people's private lives, both women's rights movement and LGBTQ organizations had been increasingly energized since the early 2010s, expanding their membership and intensifying their oppositional activities. It was thanks to these efforts that a set of innovative political habits and most importantly, a new political discourse which with its emphasis on women's rights, environmental concerns, LGBTQ issues, and minority rights became available to thousands of people who took to the streets following the eviction of uh, the activists uh, from Gezi Park. So if something did not simply tick on May 31st, what did really happen? The protesters had been in the park since May 27th, to prevent the demolition crews from entering the area, despite the ongoing court case against the Topcu Barracks project. Around 5 a.m. on May 31st, the police attacked the sleeping protesters, burned their tents, and set up police barriers around the now emptied out park. In the morning hours, calls for solidarity in support of the protesters were circulated by Taksim Dayanışması, from now on, Taksim Solidarity, which is an umbrella organization with more than 100 constituents that include, among others, numerous neighborhood organizations, non-governmental professional organizations, labor unions, and feminist groups. By early afternoon, thousands of people responded to such calls for solidarity and made their way to Taksim area, 
uh, as the day-long clashes between protesters and the police began. During these clashes, people who would hardly speak to one another under normal circumstances began to collaborate and learn from each other to fend off the police attacks. This did not mean, however, that everyone immediately trusted one another and received help unquestioningly. People did not simply unite despite their differences thanks to a common enemy, nor did their differences, contrary to some commentators, what some commentators claimed, suddenly melt away. Instead of a, a people, a group of people acting as one, there were many groups and individuals who were vastly different from one another in terms of their ideological positions and political concerns, as well as their habits and skills. It was through what I call intermediating practices, such as negotiation, strategic interaction, and sometimes outright confrontation that various LGBTQ organizations and feminists, as well as members of Charshi, a fan club, of a, a, a fan group of a football club, residents of the nearby Alevi, Alevi neighborhoods, uh, homeless youth, uh, sex workers, young professionals working in nearby plazas, members of leftist parties and Kurdish, Kurdish opposition, as well as nationalists and Kemalists, uh, were able to bring in their diverse habits and dispositions, and in certain cases, sometimes their possessions, to contribute to the ongoing struggle. It is also not entirely true that the events of May 31st uh, triggered an immediate expression of discontent or rage on the part of the people. This does not mean that rage played no role in the uprisings. People who took to the streets were indeed enraged, especially after seeing the images of burnt out tents and beaten up protesters. But the people's anger did not simply come, come out in an unmediated manner. Protesters were not, unlike what many commentators imply, rash in their actions. Instead, they communicated their anger with one another and worked together to counter and to expose the violence of the police and the government structure behind it. In fact, once we move beyond the dominant yet problematic conception of democratic action, which defines it in terms of the immediate expression of the will of the people, it becomes clear that spontaneous though they were, the protesters' actions were, did not lack organization either. During the course of the most intense clashes with the police, for instance, a number of uh, protesters engaged in a unique, if not necessarily unusual, um, form of spontaneously self-organized collective action. And starting the evening of May 31st, in various streets surrounding the Taksim area, people started to build barricades, as if, as Bashak Ertur beautifully puts it, and I quote from her account, one always built barricades with strangers on the streets, as if building barricades was just what one did, end of quote. Protesters worked together and repurposed whatever they could find around them, ranging from construction material that was left on the ground, on the burnt, uh, for, uh, on the ground, to burnt out buses, uh, metal trash containers, frames of billboards, and pavement stones to build these markers of resistance, even though they were flimsy mar uh, markers of resistance uh, at times. In another striking, but perhaps less visible example of spontaneous self-organization, on the evening of May 31st, a number of doctors of their own accord responded to messages that were circulating on social media asking for medical help for injured protesters. After sharing the, their contact info online, they directed people to a makeshift infirmary, uh, which they created in the office of the Chamber of Mechanical Engineers. Uh, the next day, in light of the difficulty that people experienced in getting to the infirmary and working in collaboration with the Turkish Medical Association and Taksim Solidarity, a number of doctors formed a database of volunteers to create mobile emergency help units composed of one medical doctor and two medical students, both to provide immediate help and to keep record of the injured in this um, uh, crucial event. It was through such spontaneously organized forms of concerted action 
that by the afternoon of June 1st, people managed to create a state-free zone in and around Gezi Park, demarcated by dozens of barricades. When the police forces were finally pushed behind the barricades, what remained in the park and the surrounding area was a vibrant public stage set up by an incredibly diverse group of people sharing in the constitution of a common life. There were significant ideological differences among the groups in the park. For instance, the sympathizers of Turkey against Likberli, Turkish Youth Union, a militaristic and nationalist organization formed by Kemalists were outspokenly against the Kurdish resistance. Anarchists and autonomists were wary of the organized far left. LGBTQ activists were suspicious of anti-capitalist Muslims and wondered if their anti-capitalist stance would lend itself to a liberal attitude towards gay and trans people. And even the relations between the LGBTQ activists and various feminist organizations were somewhat strained due to an earlier clash that took a couple of months earlier when some feminists tried to exclude trans women from the feminist night march. More than anything else, it was this aspect of Gezi occupation which demonstrated that creating a common concern among such diverse people who are ideologically at odds with one another takes more than enthusiasm or the assumed existence of a common enemy. And indeed, it was through another set of spontaneous acts of self-organization, which involved negotiation, strategic interaction, as well as direct confrontation, that those people who were in the park managed to create and sustain a commune-like existence for almost two weeks. Let me elaborate this point by giving a few examples. One of the most important points of discussion in the creation of the occupied zone was the issue of boundary setting. On several occasions, those who were in the park found themselves asking the question of who belonged to the park and who did not. On June 1st, for instance, as different groups were setting up their tents in different parts of the park, the members of the LGBTQ bloc were verbally attacked by certain homophobic groups. Other protesters responded quickly. They pushed those homophobic groups outside the bounds of the park by making it clear that there was no space in the Gezi resistance for those who insisted on acting in homophobic and sexist ways. The protesters in the park also insisted on keeping mass membership organizations, such as political parties and trade unions, away from the Gezi park area. While the organized left was able to show up its solidarity, they were asked to do so by holding their demonstrations in the adjacent Taksim Square area. It is to this arrangement that we owe this memorable image. The spatial organization of the park uh, was also the product of negotiations and deliberations among different groups and, in, uh, and individuals. According to this arrangement, there was almost an invisible demarcation line between the Kemalists and nationalists on the northern side of the park and the southern sections neighboring Taksim Square, where the LGBTQ bloc, feminist organizations, anti-capitalist Muslims, and some members of Burish the Democracy Party, Peace and Democracy Party, which would, in the aftermath of Gezi, soon become People's Democracy Party, HDP, were located. Indeed, all who were involved agreed that the continuation of the struggle staged in the park required diverse groups and people with opposing views to peacefully occupy the same place. To this end, the protesters reached an understanding that establishing physical distance could help reduce the possibility of physical altercations. While these spatial arrangements were crucial, and they played a major role in ensuring the peace and security within the park, it would have been impossible to institute a common life among hundreds of people staying in a small park without, uh, without finding practical ways to manage everyday necessities. One such practice was that of using things in common. Contrary to the popular trope that is frequently used in discussions on Gezi, however, neither the institution of common use nor what some people call the disappearance of money was an immediate occurrence. 
During the deliberations that took place in the first couple of days of the occupation, many protesters agreed that the occupation of the park offered a unique opportunity to live in a distinctly anti-capitalist manner by making it possible pe for people to share food and other necessities without using money. Yet the implementation of this agreement proved to be much more difficult than what many had anticipated. For one thing, the Gezi occupation had attracted hundreds of th street vendors selling food, masks, flags, etc. For many of these vendors, most of whom were coming from the ranks of the urban poor, leaving the area that had become a safe zone was to give up on the chance to make some money. In the end, realizing that many of the food vendors were Kurds, several people from Taksim Solidarity asked the people from BDP to intervene. After a laborious process of negotiations, a compromise agreement was finally reached. As Genghis Haksos writes, and I quote from his wonderful article, food vendors would limit their activities in the northern side of the park towards the Divan Hotel, and the southern side towards Taksim Square would remain a place with no monetary exchanges, end of quote. It was thanks to this agreement that goods, including food items, uh, began to be distributed free of charge by service stations set up by different groups. The distribution of services such as cleaning and food preparation were also achieved through collective voluntary work, which were, like everything else, organized around the principle of taking turns. Deliberately egalitarian and pluralistic though it was, even Gezi was not immune to creating its own internal exclusions. What differentiated Gezi was that as a fragile and temporary coming together that could take place only in a conflict, it was also always open to constant revision. Those who were rendered inaudible and invisible, to use phrases that Jacques Rancière uses, those who were rendered inaudible and invisible in the park challenged their exclusion in various occasions. During the first days of the occupation, for example, Members of Nor Zartong, an activist group of Armenians of Turkey, placed two styrofoam replicas of gravestones in the middle of the park with a banner stating, you took our cemetery, you won't have our park. Many in the park were aware that Erdogan's insistence to construct a replica of an Ottoman era building in the place of the Gezi Park was another attempt on his part to reclaim the Ottoman past by erasing the modernization efforts of the early Republic. Few, however, were aware of the fact that the park was constructed on the grounds of the Sur Agop Cemetery, which was seized by the newly founded Turkish Republic in the 1930s. With their symbolic reconstruction of the Armenian gravestones, Nor Zartong members made visible what had been erased from the collective memory of many of the Turkish citizens of Turkey. They also showed to use Elise von Biberstein and Nora Tartarian's words, that the government's attempt, and I quote, to re restructure Istanbul's urban space under neoliberal terms was linked to the Turkish state's history of expropriation, end of quote. It was this polemical space and the relationship of equality that it verified, which made it possible for these activists and other political actors in the park to relate to one another through the intermediating practices uh, of deliberation, negotiation, and direct confrontation. And it was these practices that made it possible for these diverse groups of people to create and sustain a common life. The laboriously created commonality of Gezi is lost on many commentators who discuss it as an immediate up uprising that lacked any kind of organization. For as we have seen, Rather than unmediated exp uh, expression of rage or anger, Gezi was a spontaneous and arduous undertaking where people of their own accord engaged in various intermediating practices to constitute a common concern and created a shared world comprised of diverse groups of people who were fully aware of the dangers involved in the possibility of facing the heavily militarized police at any moment. Since this shared experience could be realized and maintained only through ongoing activity. The joint endeavor lasted only in so far as the activity continued. And yet, 
the transience of Gizi, that is the fact that it was short-lived, should not be construed as evidence of its failure. For Gizi not only demonstrated in the most vivid and tangible ways that another way of living and relating to others was possible, it also created a new political discourse and a new set of political practices, which in so far as they are remembered, continue to call into question the strength and the supposed invulnerability of Erdogan's autocratic rule. In many ways, accounts that explore the, the reasons of uh, Gezi's presumed failure make such remembrance difficult. For indeed, many of such accounts rest on the problematic assumption that the significance of a democratic moment experienced by so many people can be measured only by focusing on the specific outcomes that it produced. It is this assumption which reduces the event to a means to an end and dismisses its importance due to its alleged inability to reach its supposed goals that frustrates many who participated in the Geza protests and who see in such questions an invalidation of their experience. Consider the following answer, which deserves to be quoted at length, that a Kurdish activist gave to the question, do you think these protests reached their goal? Did they bring about any change? The interview was conducted before the death of 15-year-old Berkin Elvan on March 11, 2014. Berkin Elvan uh, had been in critical condition since June 16, 2013. He died from the head injuries he sustained after being hit by the police with a tear gas canister. Uh, the whole interview uh, is available in Özden Melis Ulu and Yasemin Gülsüm Acar's wonderful book uh, called Bir Olmadan e, Biz Olmak. The translation, uh, as before, is mine. The activist says, honestly, we may not have gained anything. Six of our friends might have lost their lives. Tens of people might have lost an eye. Hundreds of others might have been injured. Berkin Elvan may never wake up in the hospital that he is sleeping at the moment. Still, both those who were a part of the resistance and those who weren't, both those who supported us and those who didn't, know it very well that we experienced something historical. None of us will ever forget those days. We are feeling the same things that those, of, those who lived through the 1968 felt. It seems to me that this resistance will be one of the most important, happiest moments of our lives. We have seen what people can do when they say enough is enough. We have seen that we were not so few after all. During the course of the resistance, we experienced a way of living without the state, money, police, or any other form of tyranny. It's high likely that, it is highly likely that we will spend the rest of our lives to bring back those days. That will be what our struggle is going to be about. In many of the analyses that came soon after Gezi protests, such accounts of individual experiences took a backseat to more urgent concerns regarding how to transform the oppositional energy that was released in Gezi into a long-term, lasting, revolutionary political movement. I suggest that recognizing honoring and remembering the political actors' experiences, such as the ones described by this Kurdish activist, is important. It is important not because I think we can draw out lessons from the past to produce a certain outcome in the future, nor is honoring such experiences an attempt to memorialize the, those events, romanticize them by tidying up their tensions, fissures, and disorderly aspects. The messiness and impurity of democratic moments do not invalidate the emancipatory potential of the alternative ways of living staged by the political actors. And while such alternative ways of being do not provide future actors with a blueprint that they can implement, they do call into question the naturalness and inevitability of the social order as it exists. It is precisely for this reason that it is politically significant to stand up against the current trivialization of these events, which perhaps unwillingly and un unwittingly 
play into the hands of the powers that be who seek to obliterate the memory of democratic moments and their subvertive dimensions by criminalizing them. For as Walter Benjamin reminds us, only through, the remem through remembrance can we find the spark of hope in the past, even and perhaps especially in these dark times, and keep the memory of Gezi alive as a source of inspiration for future struggles. Thank you so much for listening to this seminar. If you have any questions, comments, please feel free to contact me. And once again, I'm grateful to Turkey Beyond Borders Project for giving me this opportunity to share my work. Thank you.